afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portraits, the show that aims at shedding the light on the fundamental contributions of African Americans to the building of this country. We want to show and talk to people who have made an impact on their community and on, on our land, on America, by operating and serving the public. And who else? Who more than Mrs. Ines Dickens represent such a person? Welcome back to my Harlem portrait, Ines. Thank you so much, Maria. It's good. It's so good to be back with you. And please again accept my deepest condolences on the loss of your mother. Um, I realize you've been out of pocket because you were running between your homeland of birth and your secondary homeland that you love. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. But I'm back. So, uh, well, first of all, let's present you. You are representing Harlem in Albany since 2017, and you are currently serving as Deputy Majority Whip, which is a very big charge. That's very important. You've been there since 2017, but before that, you were a member of the council. Mm -hmm. You served in the New York City Council since 2006, and you were appointed as a leadership position, also of majority whip and chair of the Committee on Standards and Ethics. While there, you broke a glass ceiling and became the first African-American woman in the New York City City Council to be appointed to the highest leadership position of deputy majority leader and chair of the subcommittee committee on planning the dispositions and concessions. Mm -hmm. So now from Albany, you are running to go back to the city council. Yes. Yes. Tell us about these uh, elections, which are very soon. Tell us about the dynamic of this. Well, you know, I have been serving, as you said, in the New York State Assembly since 2017. Um, I've served in the city council for three terms. And, and yes, I was in leadership as the deputy majority leader. Um, while there in 2013, I ran for speaker and I was unsuccessful, but it opened the door for us to have a black woman um, to be a speaker today, Adrian Adams. And prior to that, a woman of color, Melissa Mark Viverito. So it, you know, it did help and open the doors, and I'm I'm happy that I did it. Um, in the assembly, I am now in leadership. Uh, it's important that uh, blacks serve in leadership. But my reason for running for the city council was because I was asked by several members of this community, several groups, tenant associations from Harlem River, um, from uh, St. Nicholas, from uh, A. Philip Randolph, several small businesses, several cultural institutions, um, uh, several uh, of our um, groups that are fighting gun violence, all asked me to please return to Harlem. And I'll tell you why. Because of the three levels of government, the city, the state, and the federal, the city is the only level where an elected is able to invest uh, budgeting in their community that they represent. Right. On the state level, you have a, a small amount, but everything for the most part is statewide. Now you do get a small amount, and depending upon seniority, you may or may not get much. Right now, I'm not senior. So it means I don't get as much as a senior member obviously would, would get. On the federal level, and for the community. nationally and internationally. So you, people asked me because they felt that Harlem had lost so much as far as leadership, as far as, as political uh, power, as far as economic power, as far as investment into the community. Um, many of the community, they were worried, they were concerned. They felt that after a pandemic, coming out of a pandemic, 
that economically our small businesses were in trouble, as were our cultural institutions, our famed Schomburg Library. And so they wanted someone with experience. They felt that they had tried a freshman with the last, um, in the, the present incumbent, and that they felt that it had not worked. I'm not making a comment on that one way or the other, but that's what others felt. And now they feel like they don't want to go back and return to another freshman because it's like a two-year term to a learning curve. Yeah. And if they don't, the, this community, we do not have the time to wait for another two years. That would mean four years or six years. And they didn't want to go back to that. Yeah. And so they asked for someone with the experience, someone who has run already, served, does not have to learn how to do the budgeting, does not have to learn to, to how you work within a convoluted political yeah. and budget system. And the main thing that the city council does, although it does legislation, is land use, which impacts upon your ability to provide income targeted housing and budgeting for your community. So that's why I ran is because I was asked by members of the community to return to the city of New York. Since it was a two year term, they were asking if I could get in there and turn it around. And in the meantime, um, someone who would be interested in the values who continue to reside and live in Harlem, not just come from Harlem or born to Harlem, but continue for the years to live in Harlem that understands what has occurred to us over the years, both politically and economically. And so that's why I ran. And who better than you who were born, raised, who have served in this community all your life and who you have a family history of your dad and your uh, uncle who were also serving the community. Oh, and that's very important. And it's not just being, uh, you know, it's important to me that I was born and raised, but more importantly, I never left. So I don't have to come back into the community to try to relearn what the community of my birth uh, is about. I, I stay here. And I continue to fight and invest for my community, Harlem, that I love so dearly, instead of leaving and going someplace else where um, I return and want to relearn what the community is about. That's right. That's exactly what it is. So tell us a little bit about these elections that are coming. Because uh, usually they are every four years, but now they are a two-year term. Tell us why this is happening. It has to do with- Every reason. 10 years, there's census. And it's important that people fill out their census report because that's how federal dollars is calculated on how much will come into each congressional district. So the more people that complete the forms, the, the more money a congressperson, in this case, Congressman Adriano Espayat, would be able to get for this congressional district. But- Along with the census and based upon the census, uh, lines are drawn for the congressional district, for the assembly district, for the Senate district, um, not United States Senate, but state Senate, and for the city council. And that means that there, uh, for the, in the city council, because of redistricting, there are only, will only be two year terms. So there was two year terms that's just ending in December of mm -hmm. this year, 2023. And this election would be the second two-year term. And then it'll go back to the four-year term. Now you're only elected to two four-year terms by, by the constitution, that's all by law. That's all you can serve is two four-year terms. But in, in this case, it's only two year and then two year. Uh, and then you'd have to run again after two years. Mm -hmm. So the, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And when you do this is because you love what you do and you love the community you're serving. Well, I was raised in, in a family that believed in Harlem, believed in black people, believed in the empowerment of black people. You can't do everything for everyone at every given moment. You you can't, I'm not, I'm not God. But the truth of the matter is that I was raised to love this community and I love this community dearly. That's why I never left it. 
That's why my family invested in it because before it became sexy, my family believed in generational wealth for the community. And I was always told that you cannot do it alone. You have to bring everybody along with you with the, for the opportunities for them to be able to avail themselves of it because otherwise you can get knocked off. And yeah. with one finger, you, you can be blown away. With five fingers, you got a fist. And so I was always taught that yes, we want political empowerment. We want generational wealth the way everybody else, all other cultures do. We want it too, but we have not been able to get it, but we believed in it. And my family taught it to, to my family and tried to teach it to as many people as they could because that's the only way you can save your community and be able to stay in your community. Everyone will not be able to own, everyone will not be able to do everything but we've got to have sufficient numbers so that we are never moved out of our community. And that's what's happening now. Yes, absolutely. And talking about this, what do you think are the most important issues that uh, this community needs to have solved soon, as soon as possible? Maria, and always. Income targeted housing is necessary. So that's a major issue. Also today, a major issue is the oversaturation that's occurring in Harlem, the dumping that the, the state and the city is doing in our community with not only uh, the, the drug programs, because we know that drug programs are badly needed. We also, uh, everyone is aware, mental health programs badly needed coming out of a pandemic. That's why we've got so much mental health issues because uh, it, they weren't attended to, they weren't funded, and people were left to, to fend for themselves and did not get their proper medication and there was no follow up. And now, today, we're finding that what occurred during the pandemic, we now have a uh, uh, mental health issues on the street and and now we're talking about oh we need to do something about it but we let them just just flounder for them for, for, for two years and so that's a that's an issue in Harlem the housing the mental health and public safety oversaturation of our community and it's the the other issue is the uh um the issues about the asylum seekers now Black people have been targeted and 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 were strange fruit on the poplar tree, both in the South and in the North. So we understand racism and dislike just based upon your color or based upon your hair or based upon your, your language. And so we have always had our arms open wide for everybody to come. But because we've got so many programs uh, uh, shelters in our community, we have said no more, share it. Let all the communities in the five boroughs be able to share in that. And I had a legend, I had a bill that I submitted that addressed that issue uh, about sharing, that all communities had to share in it. And that if there was uh, X amount, I don't remember the exact amount, but if there was X amount of shelters and asylum seeker programs, because it's not about being anti anything. No. It's about the fairness of the receipt of services. And the classrooms were already enlarged in Harlem and now they're going to be enlarged any, every, even more so. And so all Harlem residents are saying, let everyone share in it so that we all will get equal amount of services instead of Harlem getting the same amount of services but an increased population. Having to share it among more people, yes. same amount. I, I I totally agree with you because since the pandemic, I've always felt totally safe walking anywhere in Harlem, mm -hmm. evening, night, no mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. But since the pandemic, there is so many people, so many people walking around who are mentally, mentally ill. I had to call the ambulance three times the last three times I went out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've never seen that before. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. And you are absolutely right. It's because of the people who are go going to these centers. And it's not fair also that these centers are near schools. Because absolutely. I have experienced zombies. Zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was going to the airport early in the morning, six o'clock in the morning on 125th Street, we were driving. And I mean, these people were just walking around in the street with, and you could see they were not, they didn't know where they were. And this is not fair on them. And it's not fair on the young people who see them when they go to school, it's dangerous. It's so not fair for our, families, our children, our seniors, it's not safe. And and mentally ill, don't they don't necessarily, they're not aware, they're not cognizant of what they're doing. And so, if they were on their medication, mm. they might not do some of the things that are happening now. And that's coupled with the violence that we're having, the gun violence that we're having. And New York has some of the strongest gun laws in the country. But until the federal government makes it a national law, Guns are going to be transported across state lines. And trust me, some states that's, that have open carry and, and uh, they sell guns, they're not going to ever let states' rights be uh, yeah. uh, destroyed in any way because they're making money. Now, New York doesn't have gun manufacturers. Not, you know, we're not selling them. We're not making them except those that are making ghost guns and and because you can get the pieces that are needed transported in the mail and That's they perfect. and they're making the guns in their home so i i mean so until that's done and i i don't know if it's ever going to be done because the the states that sell them and have open they're not going to ever agree to that and their congresspersons their constituents don't want it changed so they're going to go with those that vote for them this, this gun issue is something that no one in the world understand about America, especially in, in Europe. We do not understand how is it possible that the Republicans don't understand the connection between the increase in uh, mass shootings in schools everywhere uh, and the and the violence perpetrated with guns, machine guns, assault guns, is linked to guns. They say it is not linked to guns; it's linked to mental health. Yeah, but, but know, they were you mentally know, ill without guns; they couldn't kill people. You know what, Maria? The thing is, it's not just Republicans. There are Democrats that represent states where the state's rights, they want them preserved. So it's not just, in New York, yes, we're hard about it. Our US senators, Chuck Schumer and, and Christian G Gillibrand, they're hard in support of strong gun laws. But in, in other states where there are Democrats that mm -hmm. represent open carry and where guns are so they're gonna go with what their constituents wants. And their constituents don't want any disturbance to states' rights. And until we're able to really fight the battle, see, we here in New York, we, we argue and we holler, for, but New York, we, we're there, we're there. It's the other states. And, and that's what I gotta give Bloomberg credit for because Mayor Bloomberg, after he was out of office and even during while well, he was in office, he campaigned in other states where the, they want states' rights preserved for guns to be sold, he went into those states to explain what was happening in other places that had strong gun laws, but he wasn't successful, un unfortunately. Of course, he wasn't the successful. gun lobby is too, too, yes. too powerful. That's too powerful. Ah, this is so bad. And it's not just the, the gun lobbying, it's people who live in those states, residents who live in those states who want open carry. The rest yeah. of the voters in those states want guns to be sold. See, this isn't just, just strictly the, the lobbying. It's more to it than just the lobbying. It's the people, the residents, the voters who live in those states, just like the voters in New York want gun control. 
the, the residents in those states do not want it because they receive revenue, tax revenue from the guns being sold to other places. That's why. I didn't know that. Huh. That's interesting. So what is your vision if you are successful in this run in city council, what is your vision for the district? What are the first things that you want to do? Well, I'm going to tell you, I don't, it's not if I get elected. Um, when you get elected. Positive. I think positive. I don't take advantage. I don't assume. I have to work very hard to sure. get the community to support me and embrace me. But I've, I've got to remain mentally, I've got to remain positive about my winning. So yes, I pray to God, I trust that his will will be done, but I am gonna always think positive knowing that I've got to be on the grind. I've got to work hard to, to secure the support as to why my community should support me. My vision um, for Harlem is, I guess it's, 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 it's hard to say I have one vision. And that's because I grew up in a Harlem where families protected one another. They didn't fight one another. If if my neighbor or if my grandmother's neighbor saw me do, I grew up on 127th Street between Adam Clayton Powell and Frederick Douglass, then seventh and eighth. And I, if if a neighbor saw me doing something wrong or going past my boundaries, because I had boundaries. On, you know, on that block, <laughs> that that they they could speak to me and tell me I'm going to tell your grandmother. And although mentally, I might think to myself, "Mind your business," mm. I didn't say it. <laughs> I didn't say it because I was fearful they would tell my grandmother, <laughs> and my grandmother would trust that that neighbor told the truth and I was lying. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, we had families that fought together. And when I say families, I'm not talking about just blood families. I mean, connection of yes. culture, connection of, of understanding that you it's an extended family yes. and it served to protect the community. So I think of, of, of Harlem as a Harlem that has to come into the 21st century uh, technology Mm -hmm. uh, we must educate our young people in 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 how they will be able to sustain themselves economically for the future, not for the past, but for the future. It doesn't mean everybody's going to go to school to, to higher ed, but there has to be uh, uh, programs available to educate them in in whatever they desire. If it's to go to college, if it's to go and get their their um, masters, their bachelors or to get their doctoral degree. Uh, it's important, or to learn a, a, a trade. Because, uh, plumbers make excellent money that mm -hmm. they're able to send their children to college. Yep. Uh, electricians, bricklayers, and, and, and some of the um, unions um, do have uh, classes. Uh, carpenters does, uh, bricklaying does. Some of the trades do have classes where they try to encourage people to come into uh, young people, men and women to come in to learn uh, their trade and they assist them in getting um, their uh, employment after they finish and graduate from the class. Uh, and they will make them union members so that they're guaranteed protections and 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 prevail better than prevailing wages. Um, I've also uh, come up with an idea which I haven't really proposed formally to the unions, but which I really have been talking to government about, and that's to for these drug programs that we have throughout the city. That if instead of releasing them when they when when patients come in and get their medication, uh, instead of just releasing them that they be given breakfast, could be given lunch, and yeah. that the trades could come in and teach, the unions could come in and teach a trade to the patients, which will keep them inside. They will have gotten fed. They will be learning something. So when they come out of their program, that they don't have recidivism, but instead 
they have the opportunity and the wherewithal and the knowledge to get a job that allows them to make money. That now is that you need to have to volunteer to come in and educate inside the programs, and it would serve the community well because the community would not be saturated with everybody being, all the patients being released at one time, such as on 124th Street in my community. It would serve that the community wouldn't have everybody released at one time and that there would be the problems that we're now faced with. But instead, they would the patients would be learning something. Yeah. And they would be kept in, they would be fed, and then in the evenings, they would be returned uh, to to their programs where they're living. This is uh, a, an amazing and very, very constructive suggestion idea. And I hope you can make it happen because that would solve a lot of problems and also is a long term solution. Yes, exactly. Because that's what we have to look towards. Long term solutions and not short term bandages. See, right now we're putting a whole lot of short-term bandages and then the bandages are ripped off in a year. And that's it. That's it. Talking about uh, housing, tell me about this 145 project and what happened. Do you support it? I support housing always. My community looks for how we need housing more than anything, well, I shouldn't say, because we do want public safety. We don't want good schools. We do want uh, uh, hospitals that can treat us properly. But uh, the thing is we do need housing. Yeah. And and so I do support 145. I would have maybe negotiated it differently because my way of doing it is I negotiate to get the lowest AMI for the highest number of units without killing the development. See, that's important to, because see, we have to be careful. Uh, area median income, AMI, is based upon uh, different counties. And in New York, the county that's included in ours is Bergen County in New Jersey, which is a, a, a very profitable county and that raises our AMI. So it's important. Tell us what is the AMI? Area median income. Okay, thank you. Which means it's based upon several counties, including Bergen County, and not upon the area income, which would create a lower AMI. And that's how it's uh, rents are set in, in subsidized housing. And that's how um, you determine what the income levels are for uh, uh, income targeted or what they call affordable housing. So it's important that you be able to fight. And it's really a city council, unless it's state land, it's a city council issue. Yeah. Um, you know, because there's issue like um, the cannabis estate. Uh, the, the, um, when we talk about uh, bail reform, that is state. When we talk about uh, what needs to be changed in the judicial system, that's state, okay. not city. But you've got to understand what you're arguing for, for the job that you're seeking. And so in the city, we impact upon housing. And so we need to be able to, your city council person has to have the knowledge of, of and the clear understanding of underwriting. If they don't understand underwriting, they're not going to be successful. That's why when I was in the city council before, many city council members, my colleagues, asked me, Gail Brewer did, Christine Quinn did, Al Van did, Mike McMahon, who then was in the city council from Staten Island, they all asked me to help them with land use issues in their districts because I had a clear understanding of underwriting, which can be used to protect your community. And so it's important that you be able to lower the AMI for an increased number of units. Now there's got to be varying, you know, it's not gonna be all 
of low income or very low income. The federal government is not building Section 8 housing the way they were doing before. That's over, that's dead. And at least for the next 10 or 20 years, it's not going to happen or ever come back. But in the 70s and in the early 80s, HUD was building all this housing with subsidies, deep subsidies of Section 8. Well, they, they're not doing that anymore. Yeah. The so state is the... investing money in, but they have to invest money in NYCHA, even though it's a mayoral agency, by the way. Uh, uh, NYCHA is a mayoral agency. It's not even a city council agency. It's a mayoral oversight agency. But the city council is investing heavily to try to protect NYCHAs. And the state is also investing to protect NYCHAs. So the, the feds have, have dropped it. And we've got to understand what's happening politically to us. And I'm talking about nationally. We've got to understand what's happening so that we can do what is necessary to protect our communities. And if you don't have a clear understanding of it, then you're not able to successfully represent your community. So when you ask me about 145, it would not be dead today with me. But and I'm not that arguing. Now you think it is dead now? Yeah. Well, no, it's, well, he's refiled. It was, it, yeah. yes, it was dead. And he's refiled and he's uh, increased a certain amount of units. And he also put in a community center. There's a few things that, that the developer made changes to. And the incumbent today has now said that this is a development that she can support. Whereas before she was fighting. And I'm not arguing whether she was right, wrong, whatever. I'm not attacking her. I'm not interested in attacking her. I'm just saying I would have done it different. Yes. You would have negotiated instead of blocking. Yes, because I don't believe in killing the development because I, I know my community wants housing. Other communities may not want housing. Other communities may have other needs because they have sufficient housing. My community does not. On this note, the time is gone. Already? Already? Yeah. No, we've gone over time. So when you're going to see it on TV, they will cut it out. At oh, I feel so bad because there's so much I have to say, so much I want to tell you, so much I would like to discuss, so much. I love Harlem so much. It's just sometimes I cry. I Listen, since I moved in Harlem, I met you from the very beginning. And from the very beginning, I saw you working your off. <laughs> okay? <laughs> always, always. I've seen you working and working and working. And because I have a knowledge of politics, because all my life I work in politics in the European Parliament, I recognize those politicians who do their job because they love the people and they want to serve the people and those who do that job because they want to have a chair to sit on and money coming in without looking for a real job. That's the point. So, and some do it you. Because not knocking anymore because some do it because they want to be called honorable. Some do it because somebody else is behind them pushing you know, going to, to other places. And instead of investing in those that were born and raised and, and continue, even if they moved in, continue to reside in, in, in a community, um, you seek to go outside of the state. That's, that's, that's just unconscionable. You, are you saying that there's no one in your entire county or, or, or in your district that you could, uh, could support? to run for, for an office, I disagree with that. Yeah. I disagree, and I think that, that that means you're saying in in your community, you're telling young people that may aspire to run that I don't believe in you. I have to go elsewhere. And, and I don't, I don't agree with that. I believe invest where, cast your bucket down where you are. And this is what your family did because I've seen, the first time I came to Harlem, that was uh, in uh, 89, 90, okay? But I've seen movies about Harlem in the 60s. Yes. And a family like yours who decided to stay and invest is because they really believed. Because they, 
the images I saw, it, it looked like uh, that a place that had been bombarded. That be exactly, exactly. My family came here in 1916 to go back to Africa with Marcus Garvey. Now there were several other families that did the same thing. The Horsford family, um, uh, Aaliyah Horsford's family, um, Victoria Horsford, that family, uh, the Edwards family up on uh, St. Nicholas Avenue in Harlem. We all, all of them, that whole group of families came to Harlem to go back to Africa with Marcus Garvey. They were Garveyites. And we history teaches us what happened to Garvey. And so what happened is that those families all cast their buckets down where they were. They believed in investing in the community that they now lived in, that they loved, and that they were never going to ever leave. And they didn't. My from from that time of 1918, my family never left Harlem. Never. And we always strove to protect Harlem. And 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 so did those other families. We're not the only ones. And there's other families that came in the 40s. Obviously, I mean, this that we're not the only, we don't have exclusivity to this, but we did stay and do that. And I'm still casting my bucket down where I, I, I've never owned in, in, in other states. I've never owned in Georgia. I've never owned in, in Maryland. I don't own anyplace else. This is, this, this is uh, a very important thing you're just saying. Because most people wouldn't do that. Most people would invest in other places too. And they have. Yes, <laughs> and yet they seek office, but but I never, I've never, I've never owned anything anywhere other than in Harlem. You believe in this community you love, and this community loves you. Well, I love this community. I I look at the architecture that we have in Harlem. It's yes. it's best in the in the world. And I walk down Malcolm X Boulevard. I I look at the. Fire Watchtower in Marcus Garvey Park that I was able to fund for refurbishing that can serve as a tower for not just Wi-Fi for Northern Manhattan, but it can serve for emergency purposes if we're ever attacked again in New York. Yes. I want to thank you, Maria, for allowing me this opportunity to share my thoughts, to discuss my love, and to ask my community to continue to support me and uplift me and, and keep me on the right path. Thank you for, for hosting this, for allowing the community to have access to media that they would not otherwise have. Maria, you're the best. Thank you. You are so kind. I, you know, okay. You know, I love this community. Yes. So I understand your love for this community because you are this community. <laughs> I just moved here and fell in love because of people like you and people in this community who have embraced me. Yes. Made me feel this is family. Yes. This is my family too. Yes. So uh, for someone like you who's been serving it all her life, I just have love, appreciation and respect. So thank you for being on this program. And you know that this program is done because what you said, I want, especially in other in the rest of America and in Europe, I want people to know what black people are doing in this country, what they have been doing and what they've been going through and what they still go through. Because mm -hmm. when I am in Italy, the news that I hear here, I don't hear them. I can mm -hmm. hear one bad news about someone getting shot and so on, but I don't hear the good stuff, the um, achievements of Black, African-Americans, brown people in this country. You don't mm -hmm. hear that. And this is my way of giving back to Harlem is people have to know, people have to understand because if 
people open their minds and understand other cultures, we wouldn't have wars. That's true. That's very true. But this That's is what true. we need. We need more love and understanding. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, sweetheart. Thank you. And uh, thank you to our viewers. We'll see you back next time, next Saturday, 1230, for another episode of My Harlem Portraits. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.